If you like what you hear on the Security Ledger podcast, you might want to check out one of our cybersecurity newsletters like the Daily Ledger or the Weekly Ledger. You can sign up for them at securityledger.com slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to the Security Ledger podcast. I'm Paul Roberts, the Editor-in-Chief at the Security Ledger. In this week's episode, we kick off 2018 with a pair of predictions for the new year from two of the smartest guys in the information security business. Lawyer and lawfare blogger Paul Rosenzweig speaks with us about the year ahead, including the possibility of a data war between the U.S. and the European Union, and in an environment of persistent and damaging data breaches, Experian Vice President for Consumer Protection Mike Bremer comes in to talk to us about his company's data breach industry forecast for 2018. But first, the big news of the week came from researchers at Google who discovered serious vulnerabilities vulnerabilities in software that powers the processors in most computers, laptops, and smartphones. The implications of those holes, dubbed Meltdown and Spectre, are huge, not just for the billions of users out there with affected gear, but also for the major chip vendors, including Intel, AMD, ARM, and more. To understand a bit more about the flaws and how they manage to affect chips by so many different vendors, we invited Joe Unsworth, an analyst at Gartner who has covered the semiconductor industry for the past 15 years into the studio. To start out, I asked Joe to explain the reach of the security holes and whether the chip industry has ever seen a security flaw like this. My name is Joe Unsworth, and my title is Research Vice President in our semiconductor team. This spans all of microprocessors. You know, this is an Intel issue, this is an AMD issue, this is an ARM issue. This is also an IBM Power, a mainframe Z-series issue, and Spark issue. So this has amazing reach, and that spans, of course, PCs, smartphones, servers, I mean, pretty much everything that's using a microprocessor, uh, which I don't think we've seen anything, a security vulnerability uh, of this magnitude. Now, I do think it's important to provide some context. This is a very obscure vulnerability that must be done locally to access the memory, the privileged memory content. But while this is kind of very, very difficult to do, which is why it's been undetected for so long, it does potentially have high risk. And this, of course, would be through the meltdown version. There's three kind of variants here. So this is the meltdown that I'm referring to that's been described by the Google researchers. And this is where you could potentially get access to Passwords, encryption keys, and other sensitive information. And that has very profound implications for a wide variety of different customers. And that would be data that was stored in the in the uh, kernel memory there, uh, very low low down in the um, in the operating system on these device uh, on these devices, right? That is correct. And so this is very difficult, right? I mean, you would have to be able to, again, you have to have, be able to introduce the malware locally. And it's almost as if the analogy we've been kind of tossing around is if you know your neighbor is leaving the house every day at 8 o'clock, you have to time this to be able to get access to that data. And then you have to interpret that, hey, he's left at 8 or 8.45 or what have you, and then what to do with that data to then you know, have nefarious intent. So this is indeed very difficult. Uh, many of this, the teams that the vendors have been able to replicate the malware, uh, excuse me, the, the meltdown situation, but the Spectre, the other two, uh, are more difficult to replicate, but theoretically are possible. So this is where, again, very difficult to do, but potentially high risk, which is why uh, we're seeing everybody working on patches. And again, I think it's important to provide context. This was discovered uh, earlier. I'll let you know, the, the vendors disclose whether how early they're going to mention this, but they've been working on this for several months in order to provide uh, and work with the software vendors, whether it's the hypervisor vendors or the OS vendors, et cetera, to provide these software patches. But there is a drawback to these patches, and certainly in data center environments, there can be a performance impact. These platforms, these CPUs, are all different from each other, kind of by design. I mean, they, they, they compete against each other. How was it that all of them ended up vulnerable in this same way? Yeah, well, they do speculative execution, which is a, a means of which they use to accelerate the processor ability, but they, you know, I think collectively, no one really realized that there is this side channel 
security issue, which is, again, being able to access that privileged memory data. I think today's environment is a lot different than years past, uh, certainly from a security perspective, from a matter of hacking and, and just the amount of nefarious intentions of some of these bad players out there. So, you know, these issues have been going on for, for years and years. I believe you know, some of the numbers go all the way back to 1995. But today's environment has to be far more security focused at a chip level perspective. But the reality here is they're not going to be able to fix this with a hardware patch. There is no such thing. You have to redesign hardware. And that's going to take several years, maybe even a little bit longer, one, two, three years. could be longer depending on how quickly they're able to redesign these processors to, uh, to fix this problem. This is why it is a software patch uh, that must be applied to fix this security vulnerability. So a couple issues there. As you said, it might take them a number of years to redesign the chips around this problem. And then, of course, it would take many more years for those tri chips to make it out into the marketplace to replace the vulnerable chips that are already deployed. I mean, we've got a deployed or install base here of billions of devices of all different shapes and sizes, right? right? So this is not, there's no short-term solution to any of this, really. Well, I mean, there is. So, so we're not, we're certainly not advocating that go and, you know, get rid of your hardware. There is no hardware replacement yet. So this is a software fix and it can be mitigated via software. And that's why you've seen announcements from Microsoft and Google and, and Amazon from a cloud saying that they have deployed patches. The, you, if you go to Red Hat, they do and have been working on and have deployed patches currently uh, for their hypervisor. Citrix, all of the major OS software virtual uh, hypervisor vendors are all working on these patches. But there can be a drawback. It depends on your application and particularly the workload. These patches, again, if you're in a highly virtualized environment like VDI, and you might have high CPU utilization rates, can impact performance. Now, it looks like for most common workloads in data centers, it's a zero to maybe 5% performance impact. Can it be higher? Yes. If your CPU utilization is running high, then it can be higher than that. In fact, maybe up to 20%. Yes, there was a corner case out there to 30% performance impact, but you know that is a corner case. So you know we're trying to temper the reality here because we've seen some of the cloud vendors, as I mentioned, Google, Microsoft, Amazon come out and say no performance impact to their patch. But for all those tier two cloud providers, uh, the VDI environments, the hypervisor, we do believe there'll be some performance impact. So the key is for customers and corporations is to understand what level this performance impact is. Should you patch? Most likely, but understand and roll out these patches in a measured approach so you can understand the performance impact and then react accordingly. Also, we do believe that the patches can evolve and get better at mitigating these performance issues. It's still early on. We're only a few days into this, right? But what we're hearing is that you would expect the patches to continue to get better, and perhaps an early performance impact could be mitigated over the next couple months. We don't know by how much, uh, but you would expect that they would get better uh, at, at trying to minimize that performance impact. But that could be a big deal for, for certain customers, certain data center customers, running certain workloads where performance is a premium. So Intel and AMD and Apple and so on have all come out with patches. Well, let's just take Intel, AMD, ARM. Um, they have patches for their hardware. Are those subsumed in the software patches that you might get from a Microsoft or a um, Apple or uh, a Red Hat? Or do you separately, as a downstream customer, need to apply both the um, low-level firmware update from Intel and the operating system update that takes advantage of that? I believe you're going to need to do both. You, you want to follow recommendations of uh, whatever solution you're running. You know, all these vendors, whether it's IBM, Intel, uh, AMD, ARM, all have recommendations. The software vendors do as well. Many of them are saying patch now. But again, I would say do a measured approach. Uh, so I, I think ultimately, you know, unless you're in a select environment, uh, perhaps, you know, in IoT or, or some other specific areas where you don't think you're having exposure or are not externally facing, you could wait. We're not advocating it. You do. Um, but we're, we're definitely advocating follow recommendations of the vendors. Uh, they're all putting this on their websites, expect proactive push out there from the vendors. But it's also early, and some of the patches are not fully there yet. You know, we've seen some of their announcements from 
Microsoft, Apple, Google. Uh, but they, of course, have plenty of resources to throw at this. And, you know, in the case of Google, they discovered the issue early on with, along with a few other researchers from different places. So, uh, you know, the reality is your re results will vary uh, based off of, you know, who you're working with. You know, we've seen, for example, uh, Google Chrome should have a patch out soon. Apple has put out one patch, working on the Spectre patch. I think I saw Firefox come out yesterday. You know, it's, it's been a fire hose of information to, to deal with. Uh, but reach out to your software providers and ask, where is the timetable of the patch? And do they have any performance impact guidance for deployment? Uh, because you should be mindful of knowing the performance impact. The other key thing that we're realizing is that in the case of data centers, if you're in a VDI environment or a hypervisor, it looks like you have to reboot if you're going to have a hypervisor patch. That could be a problem if you have if you can't tolerate downtime, um, if you have to do a lot of rebooting or the reboots take a long time. So just understand the other associated costs like time and, and rebooting uh, when making these patches or implementing these patches. Yeah, there's a big cloud impact here, isn't there? Absolutely. Uh, they cannot tolerate risk, right? So they are all over this. And they have to be, right, because uh, they have access to a lot of different companies' data, and any vulnerability is just unacceptable for them. But, of course, people are paying for capacity and performance. So they need to make sure that they can try to mitigate as quickly as possible any performance degradation for customers, which is why they were some of the first, the largest ones, uh, were some of the first to come out and say, yes, we have patches in place, and we're seeing very minimal performance disruption. Uh, now, that needs to be carefully monitored, and we have more concern about the Tier 2 cloud providers and hosting companies. But again, it's an area that's uh, ongoing investigation. Do we worry that there may be a, a long, there may be a substantial population out there that does not apply these patches and that is uh, this, this becomes kind of an endemic uh, vulnerability that is out there in the ecosystem um, that you know, knowledgeable attackers can take advantage of? Yeah, I think that is the risk. Uh, you know, obviously, it's public. So all the bad guys out there, if you will, they know that there is a vulnerability. Again, you have to get that malware locally, which, I, which is very different uh, than being able to do it remotely. And, you know, it, it, I, I think there's been enough publicity about this that, you know, if an end user is not aware of this issue uh, and it hasn't been brought to their attention by any of their hardware or software providers, I, I would seriously wonder if, you know, how a CIO is not aware of this. Uh, but two, if they decide not to, they better have a really good reason not to to deliver that patch and implement that patch. You know, I certainly wouldn't want to uh, have an issue and then try to defend myself of why you didn't roll out a patch uh, unless there's major performance degradation issues. But either way, I think the risk here is far greater than performance degradation. And you can make up for that performance degradation, you know, with additional hardware. Uh, again, we it also can vary as you can imagine, right? So, you know, we have to see what is the reality in terms of the performance degradation. And for, again, for most folks, it's going to be modest. We don't expect much impact in PCs, for example. We don't expect much impact in smartphones, for example. Uh, this is really a data center and really a VDI, uh, but other workloads could be affected as well. And that's where we're really trying to figure out, uh, we want to come out with, as soon as we can, some guidelines in terms of the performance impact by workload. That will be critical, but it's so early, even the vendors themselves are still wrestling to try to analyze and find that performance impact. That is really the only justification you could have for not deploying and implementing these patches. You've been covering the semiconductor space for a while. Um, wh what do you think the long-term impact is of this on these giant semiconductor manufacturing firms like Intel and AMD? Um, how is this, what are the lessons uh, of this incident? Yeah, so I think there's a few. I've been looking at, you know, I've been with Gartner for 17 years. I've been following semiconductors for 15. So, you know, I think there, there's two things. One, uh, chip level security is particularly important. And two, having a full ecosystem partnership, you know, working with these very large cloud providers, working with your software ecosystem to understand issues and problems that perhaps are not in your own domain to proactively resolve and think about even all the most remote corner cases, I think it's going to be increasingly important to be able to prevent this in the future. Now, this is an architectural design flaw that pretty much everyone has, you know, ran into. Uh, we need to avoid those in the future. And I think in today's environment and given this lesson, we're in a better position to do so uh, and not to repeat, you know, the historical mistakes.
Joe Unsworth, Research Vice President at Gartner, thank you so much for taking the time and coming in and speaking with the Security Ledger Podcast. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. Up next, now that the New Year's confetti has fallen, the big question on everyone's mind is what 2018 will bring. There is no shortage of prediction lists from security industry luminaries. One of the most interesting I read was from Paul Rosenzweig, an attorney, a lecturer at George Washington University, and a senior fellow at the R Street Institute who contributes to the much-cited blog Lawfare. Paul struck a decidedly pessimistic tone in his predictions, especially when it came to the prospects for federal efforts to crack down on data theft and cybercrime or to safeguard the U.S. election system. I invited him into our studio to talk about his predictions for the new year, and I started out by asking him to assess the most meaningful developments of the year just past, 2017. My name is Paul Rosenzweig. I'm a senior fellow at the R Street Institute and a professorial lecturer in law at George Washington University. Um, on the plus side, I would say that there was some modest forward movement in a in a host of areas uh, within the federal government and in the private sector. Um, the wanna cry ransomware attack didn't really hurt the United States that badly, and that was partially because of our own good efforts, also partially luck. The new national security strategy that was released by the Trump administration at the end of the year did a pretty good job of looking at cyber issues and and bringing them to the fore. Uh, so that was a, a good thing. Um, I am reasonably uh, positive about um, the new uh, vulnerability equities process, which is going to be a methodology for the disclosure of vulnerabilities that are discovered by the U.S. government. Uh, on the negative side, I think the singularly most significant uh, failure in cybersecurity uh, this past year uh, which will continue into the new year, is the utter failure of the U.S. government to come to grips with the vulnerability of the election system. So long as uh, our our leadership doesn't think it's a real problem, uh, we're not going to do anything about it. And I think that that was a, a very big missed opportunity for 2017 and a big risk for 2018. Yeah, I mean, it struck me uh, that, you know, uh, the Trump administration often seemed bent on pretty much repealing everything that happened during the previous administration of Barack Obama over eight years, except in cybersecurity, where actually it seems to me that there was more continuity than disruption in both the policies and even some of the people. I mean, look at look at who's staffing cybersecurity right now. Um, Tom Bossert, the Homeland Security advisor, is is pretty savvy in cybersecurity. The new head of DHS, Kirsten Nielsen, comes from a cyber background. She's got good policy experience there. The executive order that was released in May is is more of a let's build on what Obama did rather than let's tear it down. And that's the that's the motto that I see. You mentioned it, but in your prediction for 2018, one of the bold predictions you make, or maybe it's not so bold, I don't know, is regarding the upcoming midterm elections in 2018 and your prediction that there will be a lot of uncertainty about the outcome of those elections with the insecurity of voting systems and, the, as you said, the federal government's refusal to really address that center stage. I think that's right. And I'm not, I'm not talking about... Uh, Facebook ads and Russian information operations, which is a whole different kettle fish and also problematic, but that's not what I'm worried about in this suggestion. It's the fact that the actual uh, mechanisms of election are deeply vulnerable. Everything from the registration process at the front end to the voting process in the middle to the tabulation and announcing of a victor at the other end is painfully, painfully distributed, variable resources, variable training, kind of my, my, I don't know what the political landscape is going to be. And if the elections are not close, if the uh, midterm turns out to be a landslide for the Republicans or the Democrats, um, then, then it, there won't be a problem. But if it's close, if there's doubt about say, control of the House or, or control of the Senate or governorships, uh, I'm uh, reasonably certain that uh, there will be doubts about the veracity of the election, even if nothing bad has actually happened. Merely the attempt to make something bad happen and uh, doubts about whether or not it has succeeded will be enough to uh, disrupt 
a lot of the electoral process. We are very fragile, I think. You know, one of the truths about the U.S. election system is it's very decentralized. Um, much of it falls not just to states, but actually to localities to run and operate. And I know that from my own hometown here in Massachusetts. What could the U.S. federal government do if it wanted to be proactive to address these issues, given how, you know, decentralized and varied the voting infrastructure is? Well, that's a good question. And the answer really depends upon how aggressive the federal government was willing to be. But let's start with some simple stuff. Um, the electoral system today is in almost the same place that the electrical system was 10, 12, 15 years ago. Widely distributed network, highly variable understanding of the vulnerability, differentials in resources, differentials in training, differentials in capability. That's not completely fixed now, but it's been substantially improved upon by a concerted effort that involves standard setting, training, information sharing, and more resources, giving people money. And so we kind of know how to do this, not to perfect it, but we know how to change uh, the playing field so that it tilts more in our favor. If the federal government were inclined, it could, A, publish a set of uh, standards for electoral security in the cyber realm. B, provide training to state and local institutions that might not have the training to implement the standards. C, it could provide resources. We could offer grants. If you're going to, if you're going to do this, we'll give you money, uh, which is probably where the rubber will really meet the road because nobody has enough money. Uh, a simple example. Two simple examples. One, we still have, we have many systems that don't have any paper record at all of voting, that are pure direct electric voting. Uh, that system is essentially unauditable against uh, a, uh, an intrusion. It might very well be a standard that we would develop that would, that would drive away from that towards some form of at least a backup paper record. Second, we don't do recounts very well. There's been a move in Colorado, for example, to do some forms of statistical auditing of all elections just to make sure that the election result is accurate. That would be a great set of standards that, you know, frankly, I don't know exactly what to, what they should be, but I'm sure a bunch of mathematicians could give us some really good advice on them. both of those cost a lot of money. So we would need to give some money to the thing. And then finally, the last piece would be the information sharing piece, which is to say that it really doesn't help 21 states for DHS to tell them that there have been attempts to intrude upon them six months after the election concludes. There were kind of two different avenues in, that we saw in 2016. One, as we've been talking about, was the uncertainty about the uh, election system itself and reports of hacker penetration into you know, Secretary of State's offices and so on. The other, of course, was the social media campaigns and the trolling that went on over platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Uh, one of your predictions for 2018 is that there is going to be a lot more pressure on social media organizations to monitor content and kind of uh, filter or some might say censor what is said and posted on those. I guess if we're talking about Russian trolls, that's good. But of course, where does it end? And you say that you, you see a lot of moves afoot to really restrict what sites can post or post online. I think that's right. I mean, the, the, the bedrock of uh, social media till today has been, you know, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act, which essentially says uh, if you're just hosting information, you're not responsible for the content. You know, if I'm YouTube and somebody puts up a, uh, a violent rape video, I have to take it down if I'm told about it, but I'm not responsible for making sure it doesn't get up in the first place. Same is true of Facebook, Twitter, whether it's um, jihadi beheading videos or, or, or Russian trolling fake news or attempts to influence the election. All of that is coming under significant pressure. And a fair amount of it is derived from the realization that we as a society have been in many ways disserved by this hands-off attitude. We have lowered systematically the barriers to falsity and disinformation and made ourselves much easier prey to those who would do malicious things to to our social fabric. Uh, on the other hand, we have this huge fundamental belief in the freedom of expression and political expression. That is, 
uh, at the core of this hands-off attitude. And the two are going to come increasingly into conflict. Uh, I think that there will be a strong push in Congress to begin mandating filtering, they won't call it censoring, but filtering content, and uh, that in an effort to forestall that, the social media companies will promise to do it themselves without being forced to. Uh, and they'll, uh, they'll start taking down ads and deleting Russian troll Twitter accounts and, um, and uh, removing uh, child pornography, you, you name it, the whole nine yards. Um, I'm not exactly sure where the balance is going to be reset to, but it's absolutely certain that it will be reset from where it is right now, which is essentially uh, nigh on 100% on the free speech side and 0% on the filtering mandate content restriction side. Is there a happy medium there? I mean, you look at what's happening in China with government really even reaching into private text conversations between two individuals and, you know, filtering out banned words or phrases, uh, and obviously a very tight control over what ends up, uh, you know, in the public domain. With that as a cautionary tale, um, should we be worried about that type of government oversight of what people can say and write, you know, on the public internet? We should be worried, but not overly concerned. I'm not a big fan of, of you know, slippery slope arguments generally. I think that rational people can draw rational lines. For example, I don't think that there's any problem with developing mechanisms for identifying artificial persona, bots, and subjecting them to greater restrictions than the speech of real people. Recognizing that those types of mechanisms will be imperfect and that there'll have to be corrective mechanisms for appeal and such, I don't think that that's a terribly controversial idea, and it's a possible way of getting at at least some of the problem. Um, another part of it, at least in America, is that there sh uh, is and should be a very real distinction between the uh, speech of Americans with respect to our body politic and that of non-citizens, non-Americans. There's lines to be drawn that can rationally say, we don't want Russians buying ads, uh, but we will never restrict Americans buying ads. Both of those would help a fair amount in the election context. So these are, these are the things that are, are feasible. Um, we just have to always be cautious about it and make sure that you know, the day that we change from outlawing child pornography to, um, you know, stopping people from posting their baby pictures. You know, that's the day we start to worry. One of your really interesting and a little bit portentous predictions is that there's going to be what you call really a data war between the EU and the U.S., that is brought about by a couple things, most specifically the implementation in May of the EU general data protection rule that you said is really going to have a substantial negative impact on the exchange of data between North America or the U.S. and the EU, um, something that we've really taken for granted for, for much of the last 30 or 40 years. I, I think that's right. I think I would add uh, also, the likelihood that the European Court of Justice will invalidate the U.S.-EU Privacy Shield Agreement, which is the overarching agreement that um, is currently guiding and authorizing cross-border data flows with essential, essentially reciprocity rules. They'll, we'll treat their rules as okay, they'll treat our rules as okay, and we both make promises about that. Between the ratcheting up of privacy regulations through the GDPR and the, I expect the invalidation of the privacy shield, we'll see an era of what I think will be um, uh, European data imperialism, if you will, uh, you know, kind of our way or the highway. Um, the U.S. response to that uh, has not been terribly um, positive in the past. Uh, the Microsoft case is a good example of, no, we're going to do it our way rather than your way. And I can't imagine this administration being uh, interested in being highly accommodating uh, to European sensitivities about privacy, especially if they think that it is in derogation of American security. I can imagine a kind of series of tit-for-tat sorts of, of responses that begin escalator escalatory data trade restrictions. Uh, you mentioned the U.S. versus Microsoft case. Just remind us what that case was about. Well, Microsoft stores data in data centers around the globe. They, in particular, have a data center in Ireland 
that apparently holds the content, the email traffic of an individual who is suspected in the U.S. of committing an American crime. The U.S. government issued a, uh, a subpoena slash warrant. It's a mixed kind of systematic way of doing this to Microsoft saying, give us that information. And Microsoft said, no, we won't because it's in Ireland and your warrant does not require us to bring that data back here. The government says, yeah, the data is in Ireland, but you, Microsoft, are here and we're giving you the warrant here in America. Right? Microsoft won the case in the Second Circuit in New York. And the court said that the U.S. government's data request did not have what we call extraterritorial effect. Uh, but the Supreme Court has agreed to hear that. Uh, they'll hear the argument later this year and they'll issue a decision by July. And if it goes in the U.S. government's favor, then that will force Microsoft to repatriate the data held in Ireland back to America. That's likely to add to this data trade war that I've been talking about. Because Europe will probably make reciprocal demands on its companies, you know, Deutsche Telekom, bring your data back from America to don't store it on AWS in the United States. You better store it somewhere in, in Germany. Uh, and all of a sudden, the seamless globalized network uh, starts getting balkanized. Right. So there's a very big case right now pending before the Supreme Court Carpenter versus United States on um, whether location information that might be uh, collected by your cell phone or your cell phone carrier uh, is um, private information, whether citizens have a privacy right to that information. You predict that the plaintiff in that, Carpenter, is is going to win at court, but that we shouldn't expect uh, a unified court uh, decision on that, and that the result of it may just be a lot more confusion rather than a um, clearly articulated expansion of privacy rights for Americans. Uh, talk a little bit about that. Well, first off, I should say that nobody ever got rich predicting the Supreme Court. So so <laughs> it's worse than betting on football, really. It's much worse than betting on football. So this is this take this with us with a substantial grain of salt. But you know, you're making predictions, that's the game and and I'll own it. And and uh and a year from now you can have me on to review it and uh, and I'll own it when I'm wrong if, if it turns yeah. out that way. There's there's a couple of pieces that are going on here. The first is there's a group on the left that most personified by Justice uh, Sotomayor, who are really looking at the entire idea of the third party doctrine. That's the idea that if you expose information to a third party, you you lose privacy rights in it. So by telling your, your phone company where you are through the geolocation mechanism on your phone, you lose your privacy rights in your geolocation. That group is strong, but they're a minority. And the reason they're a minority is that the third party doctrine undergirds Almost all of our forensic criminal science today, it's the basis for uh, being allowed to tail somebody. It's the basis for being allowed to wiretap somebody you know, or or have a an informant wear a wire. Basis for access to, biz to bank records uh, as well. So, so I don't think the court is going to radically disrupt the third party doctrine. That would be too, too big a leap. Then there's a group in the middle, questions from people like, uh, oddly enough, Justice Gorsuch and, and Justice Roberts, suggested that they were just fundamentally uncomfortable with this, uh, uh, th this idea that you that the government can always know where you are. And so for them, it, it's something different, and they haven't really expressed why. Uh, it kind of comes from their stomach, I think. There's some sense in which that the reason is because there's so much of this information that it's not just that they know where you are now, it's that they know where you are all the time because you always have your phone with you. Um, so there may be a, uh, an argument about, you know, too much, how much is too much. Uh, that's a possibility. But then, you know, I think back to the Riley versus California case, which was about the uh, privacy rights in a cell phone as opposed to, say, a diary. And basically, if you read that, Justice Roberts simply said, phones are different. <laughs> yeah, I can't really tell you why, but we use them differently. They are just different now. <clears throat> and if that's the case, you know, I mean, that's a sensible thing. I mean, I do think phones are different than diaries. It doesn't cohere as a unified strategy of why it's different, what privacy means in the digital era, and if privacy in the digital era is different from privacy in the analog era. Do you think we're going to see some some more clearly articulated 
view of what they mean by phones are different uh, or how these devices uh, either require more protection or than similar preceding technologies like phones? I think I think we're going to see a combination of, of three things. The third party doctrine, the every time all day, every day is too much. And then the third thing, which is that if I know where you are, I know who you are. Uh, location is a special form of privacy. Because if I know that you're at an AA meeting, I know you're a drunk or a recovering alcoholic. If I know you're at church on Sunday, I know you're, you're a Catholic. If I know that you're at the gym Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from 6 to 8, I know that you're a workout guy or gal. So there's, I think part of it will be that location is personal, personal a thing going on. And so that's three different pieces and I'm looking to see all three of them. Finally, uh, you say that we saw we saw some really large attacks at the Mirai botnet at the end of 2016, uh, massive attacks, uh, crippling attacks. Uh, you say we're going to probably see another one of those um, and that it's going to cause some uh, real disruption. Uh, services brocked, uh, diverted or blacked out uh, for a, a period of time. Um, there's certainly been a lot written about threats to the electrical grid and critical infrastructure. Um, do you think we're going to see any steps taken to shore up some of these critical services, uh, whether those are financial or critical infrastructure, uh, against attack um, in 2018? Well, I think that that's likely to be the biggest reason behind the possible IoT um, legislation, right? Is that a lot of the size of the botnets is tied down to uh, the lack of security in, in you know, uh, routers and, and kitty cams and things like that. Uh, so I think that it is, uh, uh, that that vulnerability remains. And it's one of the more extreme that we're facing right now because it is so large in scale that it is not really readily solvable. But I think that, you know, Mirai is just the, the tip of the iceberg, if you will, and that there are other larger uh, possibilities uh, out there. Um, and we may very well see one this year. I mean, am I wrong to look at this list and see an era ahead, whether it's a data war between the EU and the U.S. or um, you know, the case against Kaspersky Lab that's going on of sort of increased balkanization uh, of the Internet and the online sphere uh, with companies putting up walls uh, between themselves and their uh, other countries, um, limiting access, uh, limiting data flows, picking national champions uh, amongst their companies and discouraging folks from outside or companies from outside uh, the country. I think that's right. The the globalized network is under attack. The universalized network is under um, pressure. To be fair, I think that that is a reflection of what we see in the world about us, right? If you go back to, say, 1989 and the fall of the Berlin Wall, we, we were at what Francis Fukuyama called the end of history, a, a, you know, a world of of liberal ordered democracy that would span the globe and where everybody would be converging on a single broadly defined set of norms reflected in things like a broadly defined network, cyber network. Today, we're uh, in retrograde from that. Everything from Chinese ascendancy and Russian information operations to the hiving off of the Middle East and and uh, you know uh, religious extremism there. You name it. It's all going in the direction of um, separatism in Catlan for, uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, that, and I, I personally have absolutely no idea why that's happening, right? Uh, but I can see it, and I can describe it, and it, it is absolutely reflected in uh, the nature of the network. Uh, the network is a mirror of uh, the real world, not... Uh, uh, not anything more nor anything less. Paul Rosenzweig, thank you so much for coming on the Security Ledger podcast. It was great having you. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.
And finally, the credit rating firm Experian has been reporting on data breach trends for a number of years. And while it's probably not accurate to say that there's been no progress, it's fair to say that there hasn't been much progress in putting a halt to devastating intrusions and data thefts. That may not change in 2018, but one thing will, the stakes for companies that lose data. That's due in large part to the advent of a European Union law, the General Data Protection Rule, or GDPR, which is set to take effect in May. To talk about the impact that GDPR will have in the U.S. and elsewhere, as well as the rest of Experian's predictions in its data industry forecast for 2018, we invited Michael Brummer of Experian back to the Security Ledger studio. With us now from Experian, we have Michael Brummer. Uh, Mike, welcome back to the Security Ledger podcast. Paul, thanks for having me. At the top of your list of predictions is that there will be a cyber physical attack targeting the United States, potentially against critical infrastructure. It's interesting that the same week that this came out, we heard uh, from FireEye and Drago Security about this Triton attack against a facility, I believe, in Saudi Arabia that Mm -hmm. seemed aimed at causing some kind of uh, physical damage to the plant or to the machinery running at it. What's driving that shift from cyber to cyber physical as uh, Experian sees it? Well, I think it's been going on for a while. More of these attacks have occurred than people realize, but few of them have risen to the level like the one you talked about most recently in Saudi Arabia. There's the Ukraine power grid. Um, There was also a steel factory in East Germany a a few years back. So you've got Stuxnet um, in the uh, Iranian nuclear power uh, infrastructure. And one of the things that, that I think stands out with these attacks is that they have gone from just private enterprise as the practice and proving ground to more of a critical infrastructure from a nation state or government perspective. And it's not going to be limited just to the power grid. It could be water. It could be food source. And as you pointed out, it re- really takes the, the digital aspect of that and moves it into physical reality And it will be a a big headline, I think, in 2018. I think we're already at the point where where you hear about some major event, whether it's a power outage or an accident of some sort, your mind does go to the kind of cyber realm. And at least for me, I wonder, hmm, you know, is this just a uh, equipment failure or is something else going on behind here? Sure. And there's there's some small examples. And I'm not suggesting that this was the case with the derailment that happened in Washington. But you look at our railway switching system, which is very archaic, and it wouldn't surprise me that at some point a actual train derailment is caused by somebody uh, in the midst of a cyber attack. So you talk about uh, the coming of the EU General Data Protection Rule, or GDPR. Uh, It's supposed to take effect in May of 2018. Um, as having a big impact here in the U.S. and on U.S. companies. Um, Explain that. Many listeners might say, well, this is an EU regulation. Why is it a big deal in the U.S.? Paul, you you hit one of the the big points that I would make on on this, um, and that's many companies don't realize that it all, all it takes is having one EU employee, one EU consumer, one third-party company that you deal with and handles data that has an EU uh, presence, all of those would qualify you following under this uh, regulation. The second thing I would point out is because even though there isn't um, any explicit cooperation between the data protection authorities in the 28 member states in the EU, Many of them have already discussed working collaboratively with state attorneys general on a notification. So fast forward to June next year, there's a breach in Germany. The U.S. company reports it to the German Data Protection Authority, and the German Data Protection Authority might work with the AG for their corporate headquarters back in the States. So in effect, you've created your first global notification standard that heretofore we haven't had. Right. And as Security Ledger and others have reported, you know, the 
possible fines in connection to GDPR violations are quite severe, up to 4% of your revenue or turnover, as they call it, in the EU. Um, That would certainly, for many companies, be much, much higher than any penalty they were likely to face just uh, via state or federal laws here in the United States. You're you're absolutely correct. And the the other side of that is not only a percentage of turnover up to 4%, or in each case, for the two levels of fine, 2% in each one, or 10 million pounds per each level. And that, for a small business in particular, would be very substantial, even to the point of potentially putting it out of business. Okay, so uh, aside from being terrified, what uh, what could companies do about this? Uh, there have been some statistics, I know from Poneman and others, that indicate there is not a lot of awareness out there um, in the U.S. business sector about GDPR and what is needed to comply with it. So where do companies need to start with that? I'm a, I'm a believer that those folks that already have a data breach response plan just need to, to take that if they do nothing else but import the same cybersecurity stance overseas as job one, set up the team that's going to respond and also actually know who the data protection authority is. Because keep in mind, this was a directive for the last eight or so years. The regulation now going into effect in May means that it can be truly enforced, but all the data protection authorities are staffing up to accommodate the reporting requirements. So it'll be important as a, particularly as a U.S. company with a subsidiary or third-party vendor in the EU to know those folks and to have that same plan at a minimum work through in the, in the EU. Do we know, do we have any insight yet into how enforcement might happen or when it might happen, whether companies that seem like they're, as you say, making an effort to do the right thing will be treated more leniently than companies who, you know, stick their head in the sand? I mean, is there any indication from regulators in the EU uh, as to how things might go down? In talking to some of the firms that we work with from a legal perspective, and large clients that have major operations, what they've been told is that the regulators are gonna treat everybody the same and they're looking to enforce it immediately. So there's not gonna be any such grace period beyond the 25th of May, enforcement will start right away because this regulation has been around and, and a couple, it has been in a different form in the UK, for example, through the Information Commissioner's Office and the Financial Conduct Authority. But even in Denmark, for the last 15 or 18 months, there has been a similar type of regulation, and they've had almost 1,500 reports of breaches that they otherwise would not have had. So there's an indication that, that people understand the seriousness of this. So that's why I think our prediction stating that there's going to be major fines levied against a corporation in 2018 is pretty realistic because they want to make a stance so that people realize there's teeth and there is enforcement um, with the legislation. I mean, one prediction, obviously, with this 72-hour notification element of the GDPR is that we might start to see a real flood of uh, breach notifications from companies that otherwise might have sat on those, either to release them at a time of their choosing or to release them when they've completed an investigation and remediation and all the other things. I mean, we've seen in the U.S. some companies uh, obviously uh, wait very, very long to disclose breaches, Um, one of your competitors among them, you know, uh, the the company Uber as well. Any expectation that that's going to change and we're just going to start to see these flags go up uh, just to satisfy the regulators and and really um, start to see a lot more of those types of disclosures? I've tried to explain to clients that the 72-hour rule is really a heads up. Hey, we've had a security incident. We don't know if it rises to the level yet of being a notifiable breach. We're conducting forensics and we'll get back with you. It's really not that big of a deal. It will chase those people that have previously avoided any sort of notification out of the woods, but it doesn't commit a company 
to having to notify just because notify consumers just because they've notified the data protection authority. But the converse is if you say, hey, I really don't know enough. I don't want to say anything. And as you alluded to, the CEO is putting pressure on on the folks to say, hey, let's let's not notify here. That would be a bad thing. Given the level of fines just for not notifying within the 72-hour period, I think you'll have a lot of companies that will say, we've had a security incident. I'm guessing less than probably um, 60 or 70 percent um, will be notifying of a full-scale breach to consumers, even if they've notified the Data Protection Authority within the 72-hour rule. Uh, Experian and your data breach uh, industry c- forecast say that the threats and attacks on Internet of Things are going to increase in 2018 and that it could lead to um, mass confusion uh, or and or to new security regulations for the Internet of Things, the IoT. Um, talk a little bit about that. I mean, Experian, you know, a lot of your customers are businesses. You do a lot of business to business, um, uh, work. How, how is IOT, um, affecting your customers and what types of adoption do you think we're going to see? And what are some of the issues around that from a cybersecurity standpoint? Well, I, I hearken ba- back to 1898 when H.G. Wells came out with the War of the Worlds, and, and we didn't know that, that potentially we might have been invaded by Martians. And, of course, there's been lots of movies and, and offshoots of, of that original book. Uh, it was interesting, even today, the, the Harvard Business Review talked about um, the Internet of Things and the world that we live in in where it's connectivity first and security second. And I think the Internet of Things is one of those where you can't get away in business without some sort of additional connectivity because of devices, um, because of the interconnectivity of those devices, um, the implant of so many pieces, whether it's artificial intelligence or just computing power in devices that otherwise wouldn't have been connected to the internet. And they say, as, as we talk about in the report, that there may be 50 billion devices by 2025. There's just too many single points of failure and too much personal identity information being collected by these um, devices that something's got to give at some point in time. And once it starts, as we've seen by some of the malware that has taken over the um, devices so far, it's just going to get bigger and have a more critical impact on business infrastructure, I think, in 2018. I mean, your report, you do a lot of work in the retail sector, um, and your report talks a lot about kind of retail's interest in IoT from mobile point of sale to, you know, you can do a transaction anywhere in the store. Obviously, there's been a lot of investment in um, monitoring and uh, technologies to track consumers as they move within a store and so on. Um, you think retail is going to be particularly uh, susceptible to this type of risk as it has been to you know, traditional uh, cybercrime risk? Retail is a one area, and of course, they've taken, as you say, advantage of the technology to track consumer trends and buying patterns and anticipate what's going on, um, whether it's the smart shopping cart, um, whether it is applications downloaded to your phone or your device. And um, I think they're going to be one of the areas that I might predict. Um, But I don't think because you have healthcare where you have so many medical devices or you have manufacturing where these large pieces of equipment, whether they're, they're construction pieces of equipment or actual inline manufacturing, they all have either a computer controller or they're embedded in safety switches and, and fail-safe mechanisms. I think it's going to spread so far that you couldn't pinpoint and say one area is going to be Um, that much more prone than the other. I think it's just wide open because it's growing in so many different directions. 
um, looking just to last year, by and large, you you did pretty well. I, I haven't I haven't added up your your GPA here, but it, you're doing pretty well. I think you've got a A minus B plus average. Um, some of the ones that um, panned out certainly nation state cyber attacks will move from espionage to war. We certainly have seen that. Um, health ter- healthcare organizations the most targeted and new sophisticated attacks emerging. Um, one that you only rated yourself a B on was the password, you know, death of the password, that um, all these password breaches are going to bring about uh, a real shift, a substantial shift away from uh, traditional passwords. And um, I note that that hasn't entirely happened yet, although maybe it's picking up steam. I don't know. What are your thoughts? I hope it's picking up steam. That, that was really um, aspirational, that we thought that, that passwords would would become more obsolete, whether it's because of artificial intelligence, because of biometrics, because of technologies like blockchain. And we didn't see it happen. And the other one, we didn't rate ourselves very well on. Again, keep in mind, this was self-grading. We didn't have an expert panel. But the C-, um, we were just a, a year ahead, or I hope only a year ahead, of the virtual reality and augmented reality mm-hmm. one. Um, as a tool for hackers, because we've seen that in the forensics of some of the large breaches that we've worked, we've seen actual solid evidence of that. So I think we did pretty well, and um, we'll we'll have to see. Um, but to have this type of grade for, for one year is pretty good. I'd like to think of it if we look, go back to, to 2014 when we first started doing that. Um, our grading might not be as, as great, but it's uh, it's good to look back. Yeah, you did go through uh, since 2014, and um, by and large, I'd say probably 80, 85 percent of your predictions, uh, well, maybe 80, uh, were correct. And there have been only a few that uh, seem to have been fads that you guys uh, called out that didn't didn't pan out. Um, but by and large, you the, the problems you guys have identified have, have continued to be problems. Yes, and, and one of the things that, that's hard, Paul, is that what we've tried to do, as I said at, my, uh, at the outset of, in my opening comments, we try to get, give advice to clients so they can anticipate some of this stuff, and we're hopeful that it be, we can put more of these trends into a one-time fad because people have taken the corrective action to stop it, and we were talking about passwords as one example. Um, and the more we can put in the right-hand column as being a one-time fad because we've given people a heads up and they've actually taken the advice, the better off we all are. Okay, Michael Brummer from Experian, thank you so much for taking the time to come in and talk to the Security Ledger Podcast. Really great having you. Paul, thanks so much, and happy holidays to you and your family. 